morning, Joe Ebert. Um, I have been involved with social justice work here at BUC for about 11 years, and in the broader community well before that. Um, today, Sarah and Julia and I will each share a little bit of our personal experience on the topic of justice. Um, I serve on the board of the Michigan New Youth Social Justice Network. That's a statewide coalition of new congregations that are helping each other do this work. It's an interesting exercise trying to determine how and when my interest in social justice really began. Have you ever tried answering the question, why do you care about this stuff? As I reflect on my own experience, I see seeds planted along the way, and it definitely was a learned behavior as suggested in one of our meetings today. Starting with an incident back in sixth grade, it was a conversation our class was having with Sister Natalie, who was telling us that it's wrong to waste things. Most of us were members of working class families, so there was a very practical side to not wasting. But a classmate asked, well, what if someone has a lot of money and they can buy whatever they want? Sister Natalie's reply was this, it's not okay to waste just because you can afford to, because someone else might need the thing that you're wasting. By taking and casually discarding something you don't really need, you're keeping it from someone else. I remember this discussion to this day. The seed that was planted was a realization that my actions could affect people I don't even know. You see, up until like middle school, we kids learned that their actions affect their siblings and their classmates and their friends. Um, so think back to when you first began to really comprehend that your actions could affect people that you don't even know. We have a confronting racism group here at BUC. <clears throat> We're reading the 1619 Project, which delves into multiple dimensions of slavery. Peggy Box, who leads this group, asked us to recall what we've learned about slavery in school. I recall learning the textbook facts about people being kidnapped and shipped to America in appalling conditions and being made to work for no pay, and that the Civil War was fought over slavery. Then my US history teacher, Mr. Schlegel, gave me his copy of the book Roots. And then I really learned about slavery. Why? Because it was history told in the form of real people's real life stories. Kunta Kinte was a person with a name and a family history and aspirations of his own. The cruelty felt real, and it was horrifying. I was also inspired by the resilience of the people being harmed and their unyielding determination to be free, to be recognized for their basic humanity. I wondered why slavery was allowed and no one was helping them. That learning would evolve over time. It's possible that this was the start of tuning in to the personal stories and the injustice behind social issues. In college, I worked in the Office of Continuing Adult Education. Now this was in the early 1980s. Adults who were working and raising families were enrolling in college in order to enter new fields of work. Women were entering the workforce in considerable numbers. These students had stories and needs quite different from the 19 and 20 year old students like myself. And our services were designed to adapt the college experience for a more varied student body. I observed that university practices could be changed to meet this need. My boss, Joan Berry, was a strong feminist woman. Our program was part of the outreach department and we shared an office suite with the director of women's studies. Can you imagine, I had four years, <clears throat> four years of this immersion. Every day in that environment was a learning experience. In part, I began learning about the many decades of work that people had done in social movements, movements from which my peers and I would benefit. And the start of realizing that there was so much more to be done. And if positive change were to continue, my generation, and I specifically, would have to continue the work. Upon entering the information technology field after graduation, I saw those adult students and their younger counterparts from the other side, in the workplace. I readily understood the need to change work practices so that households with two people working 
and raising families, households with single working parents, as well as the young people in their first jobs to thrive in the workplace. It was about understanding their stories and adapting the situation. In business, we would do this for a variety of social movements, including flexible work scheduling, same-sex partner health benefits, implementation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and ongoing work to achieve equal pay for equal work. Business policies and practices are changing as a result, and of course, the work is far from done. During these years, I discovered BUC and Unitarian Universalism. It resonated with me in part because it afforded it afforded me a spiritual evolution. I'd been taught as a kid that being a good person and caring about others would be rewarded in the afterlife. I don't know what will happen when we die, but I can see what's happening right now. The UU premise that we should care about others and work to build a loving and just community with each other for the here and now is so much more motivating. Social justice work involves policy making, and therefore, the dirty word, politics. I get why some people wash their hands of it and its surrounding ugliness. At its core, creating good public policy begins with an extrapolation of people's stories to find the common thread through them. A policy is written to address common conditions of an issue, knowing that you can't address them all, or not all at once, and accepting that the work continues. This is hard work, and there are dark days. But the great discovery is that the people doing the work with integrity are, for the most part, pretty cool people to be around. In summary, the seeds of justice that took root for me, and maybe also for you in your own experience, are these. Our actions can and do affect people we don't even know. Your one action and your one action and my one action add up, just as we heard at the beginning. There are real people and their stories behind social issues. Policies and practices can be changed, along with hearts and minds, to make things more just. And if that is to happen, it's up to each generation and people like you and me, we who have benefited from past progress, to continue the work. As many of you know, my name is Julia Fulmer, and I have been a member of BUC officially since 2016. However, I was raised at UU and grew up in the Farmington UU Church. During my youth, I attended Goosh here and was mentored by our own Tom Cranston in my journey as a UU youth. My journey through social justice work started right here as a teen, learning about the many injustices in the world. We organized our fellow UU youth, which is not easy to say, <laughs> into local, regional, statewide, even national conferences to hone our skills as budding young social justice warriors. While many people have just recently been called to engage in social justice, we former Why Are You You kids have been out there for years doing the slow, painful work of organizing, which in many ways has been what has primed us to be on the front lines of the resistance over these past few exceedingly tumultuous years. Those skills I learned in my UU upbringing, not just about what to organize around, but how to use my UU faith as a guidebook, have served me well as an adult. As our world has become more and more unjust at a seemingly quicker and quicker pace, I find myself relying on so many of these skills, especially when faced with moral dilemmas about the best ways in which to act or how to meet the multiple demands for justice. And even more so, I find myself coming back to my upbringing as a Unitarian Universalist and feeling gratitude at my particular religion. As someone who was raised a UU, I have a very different relationship to our religion than those who are finding it for the first time. As someone who went through all of RE as a child and who cut their teeth on living our UU values as a young person, 
My relig religious journey was never based on a transformation of belief systems or overcoming a traumatic religious experience or feeling relief in a new community of like-minded people. I was already at that place. My religious journey has been one of finding the best ways to live out the deeply held religious values I was raised to believe in and put them into action. I found the most guidance in this quest through our second, fifth, and sixth principles. Our second principle, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Our fifth, the right of conscience, and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. And our sixth, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Now, you use are not known to be short-winded people. It has always been impressive to me that our principles have always been fairly concise, with at least, at least when it comes to religious texts. The entirety of our official religious credo is a little over 100 words, and two of those words are justice. Think about that. In a set of concise written principles that is oddly brief in light of our loquacious membership, <laughs> the word justice is used twice. Clearly, ours is a religion that is doubly dedicated, at least in words, to the notion of justice. And while words have weight, they are ultimately meaningless, if not backed up by action. Our culture has many examples of this notion. Deeds, not words, or deeds, not creeds. Actions speak louder than words. Put your money where your mouth is. I believe that this ethos in our culture is very relevant to would-be benevolent organizations and religions such as Unitarian Universalism. Is it enough to say that we believe in these principles or do we owe it to each other to do more? I believe that ultimately, Unitarian Universalism is a religion that demands action. As religious people of conscience, who many times are people of great education and means, I feel we are compelled to put our faith into practice through tangible deeds that work to bring about justice. So how can we, as religious people, work towards justice? There are many ways. One of the best ways would be to join BUC's Social and Environmental Justice Committee. <laughs> you can see me or Jane O'Neill after service. Our Social and Environmental Justice Committee is dedicated to bringing our UU principles to life through social justice actions. Another way we, as religious people, can work toward justice is to wrest ownership of the idea of just who religious people are and what issues deeply religious people fight for away from those who use religion as a weapon against vulnerable people. For too long, we have ceded the mantle of religious to those of orthodox religions whose belief systems and issues fought for are often in direct opposition to our own and have seemingly resigned to fight hatred, harm, and bigotry done in the name of religiosity from an outside point of view. With the new onslaught of legal discrimination dressed up as religious freedom, it is now more important than ever for us to fight for justice, not just as secular individuals, but as a religious community. It is time for us to fight injustice as a way of expressing our religious freedom. To say, hey, discrimination, misinformation, bigotry, hatred, those are against my deeply held religious beliefs. We shouldn't shy away from using the same verbiage when explaining why we fight for justice. We fight for justice not just because it's what's right, but it's also what our religion compels us to do. <laughs> Lastly, the best way that we can work towards justice is to simply show up. Show up in person to actions. Show up online and share information. 
Show up with your money when it's needed. Show up by running for office, or work to get more people registered to vote, or volunteer to work at the polls. Whatever it is, find a tangible way to show up and do the work of creating justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. As Unitarian Universalists, I believe we are called to action. As I've gone through my journey of social justice work, I have always been grateful for my UU upbringing and my fellow UUs. We are a gentle, angry people, and we are hardwired to fight for justice. So let's get going. I would like to believe that I am a person who has always been concerned with justice. Throughout most of my adult life, I have volunteered for organizations that help people teaching reading to children and adults, or raising money for organizations that fight diseases. But I don't know if at the time I ever thought of those activities as justice work. So as I was thinking about what to write for this reflection and the role of justice in my life, I realized that it has been here at BUC, through my experience with Unitarian Universalism, that I have learned the most about what justice means the different types of justice, and how justice plays out in our world. And it has been here at BUC that I've developed my own personal concept of justice. Reverend Mandy said something in her November newsletter column that clarified what justice has come to mean to me in the almost 12 years that I've been an acting member of BUC. And by the way, I hope you'll feel free to report back to Reverend Mandy that I was <laughs> quoting from her newsletter panel. <laughs> but you know, everyone likes to score points with their boss. <laughs> In her column, she said that as you use, we do not have an orthodoxy, meaning right doctrine, but we do have an orthopraxy, meaning right practice. Whereas we might have different beliefs and philosophies about the nature of life and the universe, we all arrive at the same conclusion, that every person has inherent worth and dignity. That last part, that every person has inherent worth and dignity, that is where my concept of justice lives. And the justice work I do today springs from that principle. It's our first UU principle, and I learned it here at the UC. In this congregation, we're given tangible opportunities to work and fight for justice in many different areas, such as environmental and climate justice, LGBTQ rights, the immigration crisis, and gun violence prevention, among other issues. I've chosen to focus most of my justice efforts on helping the unhoused and vulnerably housed. And I found my way to this work through the volunteer opportunities with South Oakland Shelter at the now, I want to make note of my vocabulary here. Most of us are used to hearing and using the term homeless to refer to people who, whether temporarily or on a more long-term basis, lack housing or live in housing that is insecure or below the minimum standard. I've recently begun favoring the use of the term unhoused over homeless. I appreciate the definition of unhoused given by a UK organization called unhoused.org, which is a social impact startup focused on using technology to help the unhoused. In their explanation of the term, they say that the word homeless has derogatory connotations and implies that one is less than, which undermines self-esteem and change. The use of the term unhoused instead implies that there is a moral and social assumption that everyone should be housed in the first place. The moral and social assumption that everyone should be housed, that for me is what makes helping the unhoused individuals a matter of justice. Because every person has inherent worth and dignity, it follows that everyone should be housed. Our week as a host congregation for South Oakland Shelter ended just one week ago today. We've been hosting SOS here on our church campus for almost 30 years, and I have been volunteering with the program for at least eight of those years. If anyone here is not familiar with SOS, they are an emergency shelter program that maintains 30 to 35 unrestricted shelter beds and partners with over 60 host congregations like ours. Every week throughout the year, the SOS 
host congregations provide 30 to 35 adults and children with overnight accommodations, three daily meals, transportation, and meaningful interactions with volunteers, while the SOS staff helps them seek housing. One of the things I value about our SOS program is that it brings unhoused individuals into our midst and brings us as volunteers face to face with the reality of who unhoused people are. And in doing so, it destroys the notion that they are a mysterious other. As Reverend Mandy said in her session last week about the immigration crisis, we have to let go of this idea that some of us are deserving and some of us are not. Our value is not determined by where we are born, the color of our skin, our native language, or any other marker of identity. I would add that our value is not determined by whether or not we have stable housing. Reverend Mandy said last week that we are all siblings who share the same right to life. In my view, we also share the same right to safe and stable housing. Many of us, very understandably so, have an image in our minds of unhoused individuals as people on the street, often seeming unclean or in tattered clothing approaching us for money. That image changes once you spend time volunteering for SOS. I have frequently observed that on any given evening during our SOS week, as guests and volunteers are bustling around, packing lunches and preparing dinner, you sometimes cannot tell, just by looking at us, who is an SOS guest and who is a BUC volunteer. It's a good reminder of how connected and how vulnerable we all are. And it helps remove that barrier that keeps unhoused individuals in a separate group we call the other. It's that othering that is keeping us from finding permanent and long-term solutions to what is commonly called the homelessness crisis. In the Los Angeles area, a $1.2 million bond measure to build permanent homes for unhoused people was approved by voters three years ago. But the process of actually getting this housing built has been met with obstacles, including opposition from homeowner groups to building such homes in their neighborhoods and backlash from residents concerned about decreasing real estate values. In the wealthy beachside neighborhood of Venice, where the median home price approaches $2 million, some residents have gone to court to oppose the homeless center. Here in the Detroit area, especially among African Americans, housing instability is a byproduct of the interconnected issues of generational poverty, discriminatory housing, and racism. And all of these have their roots in the systemic dehumanization of the other. The homelessness crisis is vast, complicated, and sometimes seemingly unsolvable. I would need many more minutes, even hours, in this pulpit to address all of the nuances, problems, causes, and potential solutions. But for now, for today, as we're reflecting about justice, may our first UU principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person 